Hello there! Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world, and so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I hope you're doing incredibly well. I'm doing fabulous, thank you very much, and I'm so glad you've joined me for the final part of our story tonight, and what an incredible story this is. A little girl discovers her father's secret. Can you imagine that? She was only eight years old. She followed him into the wood grove, went a lot further than she should have done because because she wasn't allowed to venture too far in the woodgrove, and she discovered a door in the ground, only to discover that it led to an underground bunker where her father was keeping a woman captive. So that's a very, very frightening story indeed. So let's continue with it, shall we? And before we do, don't forget to subscribe, click the notification bell and the thumbs up, and let's continue with our story. I can see that you've been starved, because you are very thin. Your bones are sticking out really badly. Your face is sunken in. How long have you been down here? asked Clarissa, flashing her torchlight around the dim space and trying her level best to take it all in. She rubbed her eyes, wanting to wipe this all away, to believe that this was a bad dream that she would surely awaken from, but she knew it wasn't. There'd always been something rather unfathomable about her father, something she knew in her gut she did not like, and now she'd found out his dark secret. I'm not sure, said the woman. When you're down here in this dungeon, you don't know what time of the day it is, whether it's day or night, or how many days have actually passed. I haven't seen the light for a long time. Your father picked me up on June the 1st, I do know that. If you happen to know today's date, we can figure out how long I've been down here. You must have been here for about three weeks. I'm good at math, you see, so I can tell you that. It's June the 22nd today. I know because it's my birthday in two days' time. How did my dad bring you here in the first place? He's always out on the open road. He's a travelling salesman. He sells cleaning products, polishes and hoovers, all kinds of things like that. He travels from state to state. The woman considered Clarissa's words. I think I must be the unluckiest person in the world in that case. But then again, that doesn't really surprise me. I've never won a thing in my entire life. But I've always lost things. I've been unlucky that way. If you must know... I decided to hitch a lift for the first time in my life. My brother always warned me about that. He told me to never hitch a lift from a stranger. And I did. Can you believe that? But you should never accept a lift from a stranger. I mate, and I know that. My mother told me that. It sounds to me, Clarissa, that your mother is a very clever and wise woman. She's right about that. Clarissa thought about this for a brief second. Yes, I think she does happen to be clever. Why did you get into my daddy's car? It was simple. I needed a lift. But I'll tell you this, Clarissa. When I was getting into your father's car, for a brief second, I felt this wave of uncertainty overcome me, and I didn't listen to it. If only I'd listened to my intuition. I would not be embroiled in this sticky mess, would I? I suppose not, Clarissa agreed. Your father is keeping me here, Clarissa, against my will. He's doing horrible, horrible things to my body. But if I don't do what he demands of me, he punches me so hard, he hurts me badly. He told me that when he's done with me, and I've served my purpose, he'll slit my throat with one of those sharp knives over there on that table. He says he'll wait for me to bleed out. Then he'll bury me in the grove. He says no one will ever find me. Clarissa's eyes grew round. My daddy told you he's going to kill you. The woman nodded. Your dad is a very, very bad man, Clarissa. I've been wanting to die. I can't bear being abused like this any longer. I can't take it any more. You need to help me before he comes back. I have to get out of here. Can you bring me that axe over there on the table? The one next to those knives. It's beyond my reach. If you bring it here, 
I might be able to break the chain over. You want this, do you? asked Clarissa, handing the woman the axe that she found on the table. The woman gratefully took the axe from her and began to carefully hack away at the chain with huge, loud blasts. Clarissa closed her eyes tightly. She couldn't bear to watch in case the woman accidentally hacked her foot off. But to her surprise, the chain broke easily and the woman's foot was rescued and freed from its incarceration. Clarissa observed that the young woman was completely naked, something that she had managed to overlook, as the woman's body was completely covered with dirt. Bruises were all over her body, and scratches. Her face was filthy dirty, and the damp space smelt disgusting of urine. Clarissa may have only been eight years old, but she knew in that quintessential moment that what her father had done was incredibly wrong, very wrong. Her father must be a very bad man. But what if he were to come back right now? She could get into heaps of trouble. Maybe he'd lock her up as well so that her mother would never find her, and she'd never see Bosman again. And for reasons unbeknown to her, the idea of not seeing Bosman again made her feel desperately sad, and a tear trickled down her cheeks. "'Don't be upset, little girl,' said Catherine, looking up at Clarissa with concern in her face. It must be upsetting learning this about your father, I know. I'm just scared about my daddy coming back, said Clarissa. He'll lock me up. I know he will. He'll be so cross with me for helping you. That's not going to happen, said Catherine reassuringly. Everything's going to be just fine, I promise you. Your dad will never be able to lay a finger on you again. The woman tried to stand up but she almost fell backwards, as if the blood had rushed very quickly to her head. She suddenly became faint. The young woman didn't look at all good. She looked like a starved dog that hadn't eaten for many weeks. Her stomach was concave, and the ribs jutted out through her skin so obtrusively, rather like the roots of a tree. "'We need to go,' said Clarissa. "'But my father can't know I helped you escape.' "'because then I'll get into lots and lots of trouble. "'You're not the one in trouble, love. "'You rescued me, remember that. "'Your dad is the one who's in trouble. "'But I need to get out of here. "'We need to get help. "'Where exactly is this place? "'I was brought here in the back of your father's trunk, "'in his large SUV. "'He travelled over quite some distance. "'He dragged me through a wooded area "'and at gunpoint forced me into this underground shelter "'in the middle of the woods.' I do know that much. You're in Wyoming, said Clarissa. How did you find me, little girl? I don't exactly understand how you managed to find me. I thought my daddy was going for a swim in the creek. It's why I'm wearing my swimming costume under my dress. Look, she said, lifting up her dress to show the woman her red swimming costume. I wanted to join him in the water. I was going to surprise him. I didn't think he'd be terribly pleased with me, but I thought he'd come round in the end. I followed him here, but I've never seen this place before, as my dad's never allowed me to go into the woods beyond the creek. I knew my dad had a workshop in the woods, but I didn't know about the secret room under the ground until I watched him opening the door. I thought he was keeping my birthday present down here, you see, and I wanted to take a quick peek at it because I thought he was giving me a special bike and that he was doing it up for me. I always know what I'm getting for Christmas and birthdays because I find my presents. I like to peek at what I'm being given. The woman nodded. Yes, I had a feeling I was in Wyoming. It was just a feeling I had, but I was sure I was right about it. Clarissa observed the woman's hair was a messy tangle around her face and she was sure it must be very naughty, and she could only imagine how much it would hurt to brush that mess out. The woman could barely stand on her two legs. She was wobbling on her knees rather precariously, and reminded Clarissa of a newborn lamb trying to rise up on its unsteady legs moments after it was born. The woman was breathing heavily, as if it was a monumental effort to perform the most basic of human movements. "'Ah, I feel so weak!' she complained. But I've got to go with you. I can't possibly stay here a moment longer. 
she grabbed a bottle of water and began to drink it down furiously fast, as if the water might give her some much-needed strength. Was she ever going to make it up the steep concrete steps, Clarissa wondered, when she could barely stand upright. "'Maybe you better not come with me,' she said. "'You're very weak. I could go home and tell my mother in secret where you are. She'd get you help. I know she will. She won't tell my daddy we know about his secret. You'll be safe, I promise you. I won't be gone for very long.' No, Clarissa, you can't do that. You can't do that. You, you, you can't leave me here. Please, I'm begging you. I know I'm weak, but I have to get out of here. If your father comes back, he'll kill me. I know he will. There isn't much time left. I'm dying, Clarissa. Can't you see that? I'm weak. Please, will you pass me my clothes, Clarissa? They're over there on the bench. I've been naked since your father brought me here. Luckily the weather's been hot, because I've been fine. If it had been cold, I'd have probably frozen to death. Clarissa found the woman's clothes. To her horror they were covered with blood, but it was better the woman put them on than remain naked. Clarissa, I want you to think long and hard. You say you don't know this part of the woods because you don't come here, because you're not allowed to. Do you know anywhere you can take me to? that is not far from here, where I could call for help, a nearby farmhouse, perhaps, or a road where I could flag down a passing driver or something. It won't be safe, Clarissa, to go to your house. You must realise that. Your father is a very bad man, Clarissa. He's dangerous. If your mother learns about me, he could even harm her, because he'd want to stop her from telling anyone about his dark secret there's no lengths he wouldn't go to to protect it, I'm most sure. You need to come with me, Clarissa. If he finds out you've helped me, he might harm you as well. He may be your father biologically, but he's a monster. You do realise that, don't you? People are locked up for crimes like this. He'd be locked away in prison for the rest of his life if the law found out what he'd done to me. Clarissa nodded. A tear rolled down her cheek again. I thought my dad was like Bosman. A little cranky, but I thought he could so easily change. I think I always knew there was something strange about my father. My mum knows it too, but she just tells me not to press his buttons because he can be quite, quite horrible when he gets mad. Who's Bosman? asked the woman, looking perturbed. Bosman's my cat at home. He scratches and bites people. He gets cross. But underneath it all, he's really a nice cat. He's been coming around recently. I've been able to stroke him. I thought my dad was the same. He's not, Clarissa. I'm so sorry to tell you this. I know it's hard to hear. Cats can come round. They can become tame and domesticated. But some men never can. Your father is not right in the head. Clarissa nodded. I know, she agreed. It was with a monumental, superhuman effort that Catherine inched forward very gingerly, taking tiny steps, heaving and grunting as she did. It was very difficult to pull herself up one step, followed by the other, as they were uneven and were very, very steep. She told Clarissa that her body was hurting, not only from food deprivation, but also from all the brutal punches that she had sustained from Clarissa's father. She was surprised that she hadn't punctured a lung or broken any bones, given the brutality of those attacks. Slowly but surely, Catherine managed, with the help of Clarissa, to finally get up to the top step, until they were both successfully out of the underground trap in which she had been incarcerated for the last three weeks or so, against her will. Catherine breathed in the fresh honeyed air, as if it was quite literally the most beautiful thing she had ever inhaled. Oh, I can't believe it. I actually made it up the steps. And I'm here. I'm almost free. Well, almost. Where are you going to take me, Clarissa? She asked, leaning on the eight-year-old for support. I think we'll go up that path over there said Clarissa decisively. 
she had never felt more grown up in all her life as she did now. That will take us to the Clarence farmhouse. Mrs. Clarence is very nice. She'll help us. I'm sure she'll call the police for you. How far is the Clarence farmhouse? asked Catherine, looking as if the idea of walking any further was an impossibility that she simply could not entertain. After several lumbering chaotic efforts, it was more than clear that Catherine's weakened state, despite her very best efforts, was not helping her at all because she wasn't going to get very far on such unsteady, wobbly legs. It was like all the last remaining dregs of energy that was left within her had been violently ripped out of her system. She had become like a car in the knacker's yard, an old one at that, that was devoid of any gas and simply refused to budge an inch. "'You need to wait for me here,' said Clarissa, realising that Catherine could not move any further. "'I'll go to Mrs. Clarence's farmhouse. "'I'll get help for you. "'You need to hide behind the tree, "'behind my father's workshop over there. "'Wait for me there.' "'Promise me that you'll be back soon,' "'asked Catherine nervously, "'looking around and about herself. "'What if your dad comes back, Clarissa? "'It's unlikely he will. "'He's probably gone to bed by now. "'He could be fast asleep. "'I won't be long, I promise you. "'Please hurry.' Catherine said, staring after the eight-year-old girl who bounded through the trees like a gazelle to get her help. She had never met anyone like little Clarissa before. What a brave and clever girl she was for one so young. How disappointed it must have been for her to discover that her father had not been keeping a puppy nor a bicycle for her. Instead, Clarissa had stumbled over her father's insidious dark secret. The pretty little girl with her blonde ringlets and round blue eyes, looked so innocent, so whimsically naive. But she was older than her years, in terms of her emotional maturity. She was as sharp as a button, and she knew instinctively that what her father had done was very wrong. Yet despite her obvious loyalty to her father, she had known the right thing to do was to call for help on Catherine's behalf. And Catherine knew the little girl would do as she had promised. Catherine realised she was very lucky that Clarissa had found her, for she knew she wasn't out of the woods yet, though, until she was around people she could really trust. Catherine tried desperately to imagine what that little girl must feel to uncover such a horrifying truth about her father. She wondered if there had been any warning signs in the child's young life that had made the little girl suspicious of her father, that there was something perhaps that wasn't quite right about him. She had almost suggested as much. She wondered if Clarissa's mother had an inkling that there was something off about her husband. She was sure there had to be many signs. Yet, if the truth be told, Catherine could remember that her first impression of the stranger that would soon become her abductor had been very benign. After all, you would never just willy-nilly climb into a stranger's car if he looked like some kind of weirdo. But then again... All these serial killers you heard about, like John Wayne Gacy, Peter Sutcliffe and more besides, had nothing about their appearance that stood out that would warn you to keep away. On the contrary, the man who had abducted her had been extremely attractive and he'd given her a big lopsided smile and said to her, You want a lift, do you? And she'd said, That's very kind of you. I really need a lift. Just so you know... I don't do this kind of thing, except lifts from strangers, I mean. But I'm stranded, in a position where beggars can't be choosers. She didn't tell the stranger, who was giving her a lift, about the unfortunate quarrel she'd had with her boyfriend. She'd been so mad at Kevin, she had told him to let her out of the car at once, and had stormed off. She had told him it was over between them, and that she never wanted to see him again as long as she lived. And he had just simply said, That's fine by me. The feeling's mutual. Kevin had probably thought she'd call an Uber to get a lift back home. But what he didn't realise was her purse, along with her cell phone, were tucked under his seat. She knew the only way to get help was to wave down someone on the road. And it was just her bad luck to wave down a predator. What were the chances of that happening? It was when she'd climbed into the seat next to the stranger that there was an inner nudge inside her telling her to get the hell away from this man 
and not to accept a lift from him under any circumstances. Catherine had persuaded herself that such a burgeoning inhibition was irrational. She'd never hitchhiked a day in her life before, and she knew she'd never do it again. She knew that nobody would be looking for her, as she and her boyfriend had just split, and he probably didn't even bother to clean out his car. So it would be a long while before he discovered her purse under the seat. And even if he did, he'd probably send it straight back to her in the post. The argument that they had had in the car had been very brutal. There would be no coming back from this. Catherine had only recently settled in South Dakota, and her parents were living abroad in the Seychelles, and so she didn't speak to them very much. So in truth, nobody would know that she was actually missing. And if that wasn't bad enough, she'd only just been sacked from her waitressing job at the restaurant she'd been working at, because she'd had a nasty fallout with the manager there. So no one would know that she was even missing. When Catherine tried to think about what had happened to her that day, when she had accepted a lift from Clarissa's father, her memory had become foggy and vague, probably because she didn't want to remember very much. She did recall that he'd pulled out a Glock revolver, stopped the car, and insisted that she got into his trunk. She'd been so terrified. Everybody warned you never ever to get into the car with someone pointing a revolver at you. But she had not been able to disobey this man. She had been so afraid, far too afraid to do what they advise you to do when they tell you to run away or scream. She hadn't been in a position to do any of those things. But she knew with certainty that she had sealed her own inevitable fate and that she would unlikely get out of this alive. Her abductor had driven her for many hours, cooped up in a hot, stuffy trunk, in very inhospitable conditions that had almost killed her because it had been insufferably hot. The man had surreptitiously brought her here and kept her a slave for the last few weeks. He had forced himself upon her and the pain had been absolutely excruciating, like nothing she'd ever experienced before. And she had seen Clarissa's father literally get off on her fear and terror, as if it electrified him and gave him some kind of a head rush. When he told her that she should be proud, as she was his very first, and there would be more to come, she had been quite stunned by this. She had also realised after speaking to Clarissa that she had been confined to this underground prison for over three weeks, but it may as well have been an entire lifetime, for it seemed as if time had just stood still. Please, please let me go, she had cried out. I won't tell anyone you brought me here. I won't tell them you raped me, that you hurt me. I won't say anything, I promise. Just let me go. Her abductor had cruelly laughed at her, square in the face. Her suggestion had been preposterous to him. I've only just started having fun with you, Catherine. I'm enjoying myself very much. You think I want to let you go? Are you crazy? He had said, shaking his head. I haven't finished with you yet. And even if I had lost interest in you, do you really think I'd let you go? You may be the first woman that I've ever abducted, but you will not be the last. If I went all soft on you, my days of enjoying myself like this would surely be numbered, and that is not going to happen. Do I look as if I've got the word mug written across my face? I've got way too much to lose to ever let you go. I have a daughter and a wife, and I'm not going to let the likes of you destroy my life. You're my slave, and when I'm done with you, there will be others to follow. Catherine had realised that this monster who had abducted her was quite literally a psychopath, devoid of any emotions. Every time he raped her, it hurt so dreadfully bad. She'd close her eyes and beg God for it all to be over, and the more she cried out in agonising pain the more physically aroused her abductor became. In truth, death was significantly more preferable than being subject to this man's brutality a moment longer. It was on this unassuming evening, when she hadn't even realised what time of the day it was, that the monster had come back again to have his wicked way with her, that she had lost all hope, sensing that she couldn't face another hour with this man again. She had been whimpering from the pain in the aftermath of the rape. It was after he'd left, 
she had suddenly sensed she was not alone, and that was when she heard a girl's voice saying, Little puppy, where are you? Where are you, little puppy? In the clawing darkness of the clammy, sticky atmosphere, in this underground bunker, she had observed an eight-year-old girl, whom at first she had persuaded herself had to be a ghost, for she couldn't be real. Yet eight-year-old Clarissa had turned out to be the monster's little child. As Catherine sat on the earthen ground, bespeckled with leaves and twigs, behind a large oak tree, she felt consumed by her puny enfeeblement. She was so emaciated, the energy within her so faint, she felt like a dying bird, with its head flopping to one side. She kept closing her eyes again and again, as the desire to sleep overcame her. She needed to stay awake in case the monster was to come back. Clarissa was getting her help, but she couldn't relax yet until that help came. But she was so tired, oh, so desperately tired, she was struggling to stay awake. Tristan Pearson was not in a good mood after he'd left the underground bunker. He had thought the girl would be more cooperative today, but even in her weakened state, Catherine was still putting on quite the fight. Part of him was impressed by her resolve. But she was annoying him, and the sooner he got rid of her, the better. He'd have to find someone else. Yesterday he'd returned home early. He'd parked his car in the back of an old logging road and made his way to the woods. He'd spent an awful lot of time in the underground bunker, raping Catherine over and over again, until the woman was literally crying out for mercy. She had been in so much pain, and that had been very satisfying to watch. The woman had bitten him hard. She attacked him fiercely with what was left of her gnarled nails. So he'd made an excuse to his wife Nancy about a client's granddaughter biting him inappropriately because he happened to bump his hoover into her doll. Tristan had to get creative with the excuses in order for Nancy to believe him. But if she hadn't believed him, she would have known something was up with him and might eventually sniff out his secret, and that could never be allowed to happen. Nancy had been appalled by the suggestion that a little girl, Clarissa's age, had bitten him. But if that bitch Catherine bit him again, and Nancy was to notice another bite mark on him, what excuse would he make up next time, and would it even be believable? He seriously doubted it. That girl Catherine is more trouble than she's worth. I'd prefer a much more malleable, obliging woman, he thought. This woman's got far too much fight in her. The sooner I finish her off, the better. I need to slit that throat of hers and bury her in the grove. I don't think I can ever tame a wild one like her. For many long years, Tristan had fantasised about abducting a woman. But mistake number one he had made that he would never repeat again was abducting a woman who tried to fight back. The demure, self-effacing type would be so much better for him. But Catherine was no shrinking violet, even in her starved, emaciated state, which was commendable, but that was not the kind of woman he was looking for. If the truth be told, Tristan had never felt his sexual fantasies were ever fulfilled, until he'd kept a woman hostage, which was something he'd planned to do for a very long time. But the opportunity had never arrived for him until he caught sight of Catherine hitchhiking for a lift, and this was when the tide had turned for him. He could not imagine ever putting a lid on this lifestyle now. It had been so incredibly exciting to hear Catherine scream out in agonising pain, and it sent him into a rapturous euphoria that he now knew had become like an insatiable drug that would never end with just one woman. Catherine would be the first of many. He was too clever to get caught, he thought. Next time I'm going to be a whole lot more discerning as to who I actually pick up, he thought to himself. It was an uncomfortably unpleasant night. He had told his wife he was going to take a dip at the creek, and so he decided to take a shortcut to the creek before he returned home, to get the nasty smells of ammonia off his body, by taking a plunge in the ice-cold water. It was as he was navigating his way to the creek that he found his daughter's beach towel, lying rolled up in a bundle along the path as if it had been accidentally dropped there. What the hell, he thought. What was that doing there? He didn't think too much about the matter, but found use for the towel after enjoying a dip in the water and returning back to the house. 
It was as he was in the house making himself a glass of ice-cold cloudy lemonade. He thought about how odd it was to find Clarissa's towel in the grove. He thought he ought to check up on his little girl to see if she was still in bed. And when he realised that Clarissa was not in her bedroom, nor was she lying in bed, a horrifying thought crossed his mind. Had Clarissa sneaked out into the grove and followed him, assuming he was going for a swim in the creek, but realised he'd taken a different path. How could I be such a fool? I knew someone was watching me, he thought, when I was about to enter my underground bunker. I found someone there. I was certain I was being watched. Please, God, don't tell me Clarissa saw the door in the ground. Don't tell me she saw me. He knew exactly what his daughter was like. She had an insatiable curiosity on her and was always following him around like a pathetic, very annoying lapdog. What if his little girl had uncovered his insidious secret? Tristan did not hesitate to make a quick dash to the grove. His daughter Clarissa must be stopped at once, before it was too late. He'd do absolutely anything to protect his perfidious secret from coming out. The night seemed to be cloyingly oppressive, very clammy. He found he was perspiring profusely, and sweat had broken out under his armpits, and water was rolling down his back like raindrops. If that wasn't bad enough, all these nagging, inauspicious thoughts were playing treacherous mind games with his mind. He had a horrifying vision of Clarissa stumbling across Catherine lying naked on a blood-soaked mattress in the underground bunker. I have been so careful, he thought. Little Clarissa is about to ruin everything for me. I won't let her do that for me. If that happens, she's a dead girl. It had suited him to get married to Nancy when she'd fallen pregnant all those years ago. But he knew there was no emotional attachment between the two of them. The truth was Tristan didn't love anyone apart from himself. Everybody else was disposable in his life as far as he was concerned. But at the same time, being married to Nancy and having a child like Clarissa made him appear like a regular family man, which was a useful cover for him. Tristan made light work of his efficient, brisk and purposeful walk through the woods. He had the bright light of his torch guiding the way. It was when he ventured into his underground bunker, where his prisoner was held captive, that his worst, most dreadful fears were confirmed. There was no sign of Catherine anywhere. There was no time to lose. Time was of the absolute essence. He knew this. He had to find his daughter Clarissa at once, along with Catherine, whom he'd held captive for over three weeks. Catherine was very weak and feeble. She wouldn't have got very far on foot, so he'd easily be able to catch up with her. He'd find his daughter Clarissa and Catherine, and he'd slit their throats and quickly dispose of their bodies. As he climbed out of the bunker, closing the door behind him, which he concealed with leaves and foliage, he noticed some disturbed ground further along the path that led to behind the shack, and he followed it. And there, sitting behind the old oak tree, was Catherine. She was wearing the clothes she'd been wearing on the day he'd picked her up, but they were covered with so many bloodstains, because he'd beaten her up really hard, so much so that she'd bled out, before he'd forced the clothes off her. She was sitting on the ground, with her sorry head buried beneath her knees. She appeared not to notice him, but then all of a sudden, as if hit by a sudden jolt of lightning, she looked up, and his eyes bored into hers. Well, well, who do we have here? he asked her. Go away, leave me alone, cried Catherine, trying to rise to her feet, but stumbling over rather awkwardly, as every ounce of strength that she had left in her had been completely leached out of her body. Go away, leave me alone, she cried out, using her hands to fight off Tristan. But it was no use. "'Your daughter's gone to call the police. "'She's been gone for a long while. "'It's too late for you now. "'It's over for you. "'You might as well accept it.' "'You bloody bitch. "'Where did my daughter go?' "'Tristan asked, grabbing Catherine by the hair "'and yanking her backwards very hard, "'causing her a great deal of pain. "'She cried out. "'He pulled her forcefully across the ground. "'Catherine let out another pained but very shrill shriek. 
What happened next was almost paradoxical. The ground shook, as if the woodgrove had been hit by a mighty earthquake, and there were the sounds of ponderous feet, running with lightning speed through the woodgrove. The next thing Catherine knew was that Tristan had released his grip on her hair and was saying, Bloody hell! Put me down! And that was when Catherine looked up to see a huge humanoid-looking creature covered with so much hair. He was easily over ten foot tall, with ponderous shoulders, overlong arms and a ripped torso. She realised she was staring at a huge male Bigfoot. The male Bigfoot had picked up Tristan in the air, and Tristan was screaming, Put me down! Put me down! The Bigfoot appeared to be having a bit of fun with him, and then finally he thrashed Tristan's head against the tree, at least over a dozen times. Catherine heard his skull crack at once, and then there Tristan was, lying on the forest floor. He was dead. She couldn't believe it. The evil monster was dead. Was this even happening? She could hardly believe what she was seeing. The Bigfoot threw the deceased corpse over his shoulders. He then looked at Catherine through kind, dark eyes. He's gone now. I'll dispose of the body. He won't ever get to harm you again. And with that, the Bigfoot glided away and was gone. And Catherine realised that the Bigfoot had spoken to her in her head telepathically. To cut a long story short, the body of Tristan was never found. But only a few people in Wyoming knew exactly what had happened to him and that it was a male Bigfoot that had ended his life. No one felt any pity for Tristan, who in the eyes of the people that were privy to knowing the truth was nothing less than a monster as far as they were concerned. Catherine decided not to go to the police. What was the point any more? She didn't want to tell them about the depravity she had endured for three weeks. She didn't want what had happened to her to be made public, and she didn't fancy her personal details becoming common knowledge. Now that her perpetrator was dead, no other woman was at risk as far as she was concerned. Clarissa was exceedingly grateful, as was Nancy, for her silence. They certainly didn't want people to know about Tristan's dark past, as that might make them become a spectacle of public scrutiny. People would lightly point and whisper at both Nancy and Clarissa and say, "'You see that woman over there and her child? "'Well, she was married to that dreadful monster!' that attacked that poor woman and kept her in an underground dungeon for over three weeks. Can you believe that? Mrs Cameron, Nancy's next-door neighbour, also thought the secret should be covered up. She realised that the Bigfoot that had killed Tristan was the very same creature that had rescued her mother from the searing heat on one of Wyoming's hottest days. She realised the creature had very much saved her mother's life and that her mother wasn't going senile after all. Catherine soon became close friends with both Nancy and Clarissa. And two months after she had been abducted, she suddenly rocked up on their front doorstep, carrying in her arms a golden retriever puppy. You saved my life, Clarissa, and probably many other women's lives besides, who could have been potential victims of your father. So this is for you. I know how much you've been wanting a golden retriever puppy. Clarissa was delighted. Well, overjoyed to receive the puppy, she chose to call him Weber. It would seem that Bosman became a loving cat and developed a great friendship with Weber. Catherine received counselling and has since recovered from the trauma she experienced. She believes the trauma made her into a more compassionate person and has decided to embark on a career as a trauma counsellor herself. Nancy, when she looks back on her marriage with Tristan, has only one thing to say about it. I think you know when there's something not right with a person. I knew there was something insidious and dark about my husband, but I just did not know what it was. Clarissa felt much the same. I really wanted to love my daddy. I really did. But I always felt scared of him, and I didn't really know why. But now I do. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.